Egypt's Great Pyramid, the world's most famous tomb, built by a pharaoh with a reputation for cruelty. Khufu terrorized his people, and he enslaved them. A supposed megalomaniac ready to sacrifice his people in his pursuit of perfection. Now, archaeologists are hunting for the truth about this king and his pyramid. It's a good example of how hard this work was. It was not easy. Exposing strange ceremonies and an incredible lost city of the pyramid workers. These are the frozen moments that tell you everything about ancient Egyptian society. Is this wonder of the ancient world a monument to monstrosity? The story of the pyramids is one of innovation. It was a resurrection machine. Mysterious rituals. These are things that help the deceased re-energize and live for eternity. Back-breaking work and palace intrigue unlock the deepest secrets of the pharaohs. Every mummy is different. You never know exactly what to expect. Explore the lives of ancient workers and uncover the remarkable story of Egypt's old kingdom. Not only did ancient Egypt make the pyramids, the pyramids made ancient Egypt. Around 2,483 BC, a pharaoh called Khufu is reaching the end of his reign. He is about to inspect the most important work of his life. The largest pyramid in Egyptian history. The Great Pyramid of Giza. Khufu commanded his people to build him this colossal monument as a resurrection machine that will propel him to the afterlife. Today, some 4,500 years later, the Great Pyramid remains the only wonder of the ancient world still standing. It is more than 450 feet high and is made up of two and a half million stone blocks. It took over 25 years to build. Exactly how Khufu pulled his country together to do it has long remained a mystery. In Cairo, at the Egyptian Museum, Egyptologist Salima Ikram is investigating the pharaoh Khufu. There are 160,000 treasures here, but only one puts a face to Egypt's most ambitious pharaoh. A small ivory statue, just three inches high. It's the only statue we have where Khufu's name is actually inscribed on it but it has the basic constructs of what a king should be like. And it's ironic because he is the man who built the biggest pyramid, and yet the statue is tiny. It's bizarre that this king should be unattested in any other way. Where are all the images from his other temples? Where are the freestanding statues? It's very curious what happened to Khufu. Could the explanation for why just one single statue of Khufu has survived be linked to his notorious reputation? Two thousand five hundred years ago, a Greek historian called Herodotus 
investigated the mystery of Khufu and his Great Pyramid. He toured Egypt to collect accounts and stories passed down through the ages. When he arrived on the Giza Plateau, 22 centuries after the Great Pyramid was built, the monument was still the tallest man-made building on the planet. Herodotus claims that the Egyptians remembered Khufu as a tyrant, ranting and raving in his palace. Herodotus wrote really nasty things in his histories. Um, according to him, Khufu was a mean king and no one liked him because he was cruel. Herodotus wrote that Khufu terrorized his people and he enslaved them to build his great pyramid. Herodotus paints Khufu as something of a tyrant, shuts down the temples of the country in order to focus everything on his great pyramid construction scheme and whose own daughter works in a brothel and collects blocks as payment from her patrons. It's very difficult to understand who was feeding Herodotus these stories, but clearly at that time, the Egyptians themselves had a history of Khufu being not very kind or gentle or benevolent. According to Herodotus, this is how the Great Pyramid was built, by an enslaved people working for a depraved monster. But how much of this story is based on reality? It was thousands of years after Khufu, and he was collecting his information from people, never saw Khufu, never saw Khufu's sons, and they lived thousands of years after Khufu. The truth has long remained a mystery. But one thing historians have learned by examining tomb inscriptions is the name of the person directly responsible for the pyramid's construction. The person Khufu puts in charge of construction is his vizier, Hemiyunu. Um, Hemiyunu was the nephew of Khufu, and apparently, Based on his titles, he is certainly in charge of the construction of the Great Pyramid. Hemiunu's family business is pyramid building. His father was the architect for Khufu's father, Snefru. Experience he'll need to fulfill Khufu's enormous ambitions. wants to create the largest pyramid that's ever been built. And he's got to get it done really in 20 years or less. That is an enormous project. It was very stressful for Hemi Yunu. Khufu has another demand. Build the pyramid away from the tombs of his ancestors. So Hemiunu scours the west bank of the Nile for the right spot. The west is where the sun sets, symbolizing death. So this is where all pyramids are built. Picking a site isn't easy. He's looking for an area suitable for nothing less than the biggest construction site in the history of mankind. What's the high ground? What's the low ground? Where's the slope? If we build a ramp here, if we build a temple there, is it going to work? Where do we lay out our cemeteries? Where will we quarry the stone? These are all things the Egyptians had to think about. Hemiunu must do everything in his power to avoid the fate that befell his father, Nefermat. 
He hit a major problem when building a second pyramid for his king, Sneferu. Midway through the construction of an ambitious, steep-sided pyramid, the monument began to crack. The site's foundations weren't strong enough to support the huge weight. To avoid total collapse, he was forced to change the angle of the pyramid's sides, giving the monument its name, the Bent Pyramid. The odd shape wasn't good enough for the king, and Nefermat had to start again. Khufu wants an even bigger pyramid. Hamiyunu can't afford a similar mistake. Now we can imagine that Khufu is also worrying about whether he too will live long enough to complete his own pyramid. Will he be like his father Snofru, finishing three pyramids before he dies? Or will Khufu perhaps not live long enough to even finish a single pyramid? The most important thing for the king is to finish his pyramid during his life. He has to see the pyramid completed. If the legend of Khufu's cruelty is true, this is not a man that Hemiunu can afford to disappoint. In ancient Egypt, Hamiyunu's team of engineers spend days testing the bedrock to find the perfect location for King Khufu's pyramid. They study the nature of the rock and the undulation of the landscape for miles until they finally find the ideal place, Giza. Today, Giza is a bustling suburb of Cairo. 4,600 years ago, it was an empty plateau. 20 miles north of the Bent Pyramid and not far from the capital at Memphis. What was here geologically was a big plate of limestone. It was perfect as platforms for the pyramids as foundation. Mark Lehner is an American professor of archaeology and Egyptology. He spent three decades investigating the Giza Plateau, hunting for evidence about how the Great Pyramid was built. I realized that I had to turn my back to the pyramids to understand them, because I realized that without understanding the people and their economy, and their society, I didn't understand the pyramids. On the south of the pyramid, there's a clue that exposes another reason that Hemiunu chose this site. A huge quarry more than 100 feet deep. So look. Here in the face, I can see that the quarrymen know there's a weak vein here. It's actually an iron vein that makes the stone weak. As good geologists, natural geologists, they know where to exploit those veins to cut the blocks away. It, uh, it's like a freebie. Nature's giving them a little assist. They take any advantage they can get. The quarry is barely 1,000 feet from the Great Pyramid, a clever move by Hemiunu to help speed up construction. But completing the pyramid in time is still going to take enormous human effort and some help from the gods. Before construction begins, Hemi Yunu and the pharaoh Khufu travel to Giza. They need to perform a sacred ceremony. A ritual they believe will be crucial to the pyramid's success.
The pharaoh wears a special double crown. The white represents Upper Egypt in the south, and the red, Lower Egypt in the north. The crown symbolizes the unity of his people, who he will take with him into the afterlife, if the pyramid is a success. A high priestess is dressed in the image of the goddess of mathematics and astronomy, Seshat. She's brought a measuring device known as the Merkat. This tool can be used to align Khufu's pyramid to the north. The pharaoh believes that the north holds a portal through which his soul will pass to join his ancestors and the gods. So the pyramid's orientation is a powerful symbol, as is its size. His surveyors use rope to measure out just over 755 feet for each side of the monument. This gives the ceremony its name, Pedches, the stretching of the cord. With the sacred foundation ceremony complete, Khufu names his tomb the Akhet Khufu, the horizon of Khufu. After his death, the pharaoh will become one with the sun god and will disappear every evening on the horizon to be reborn at the first light of dawn. The ritual is complete and the gods appeased. But Hemiunu still needs to finalize the design of the Great Pyramid. The oversized dimensions of this pyramid must have worried engineers. But Hemiunu has no choice but to follow the demands of Khufu, who wants a smooth-sided monument. Just like his father Snefru's third and final pyramid. Snefru's red pyramid is 344 feet high, the tallest building in the world. But Khufu wants a pyramid 100 feet taller. This is going to be the largest construction project in human history, demanding labor and supplies from all over Egypt. He has to obtain the resources from the quarries, bring them up to the Giza Plateau. He's got to conscript people from around the country to come work at this site. He's got to organize them. How will he do it? On the Giza Plateau, Mark Lehner is investigating the truth about the Pharaoh Khufu's reputation as a tyrant who enslaved his people and forced them to build his Great Pyramid. To find the answers, Mark turned his back to the Great Pyramid, to the remains of an enormous wall built in its shadow. It's called the Wall of the Crow. The wall is 200 meters long. From our excavations, we know that it's 10 meters wide and 10 meters tall. This wall says that somebody intended it to be permanent. To the north of the wall, you have the Sphinx, the tombs, the cemeteries, the pyramids. Lehner asked a logical question. If these monuments to the dead lay on one side of the wall, what was on the other? To the south, I suspected there was infrastructure, settlement. 
Mark's intuition proved right. Beyond this wall, he unearthed a vast hidden city. A 12-acre metropolis that once stretched to the banks of the Nile and housed thousands of people. So it takes a little bit of imagination, but underneath this whole area is the city of the workers, the infrastructure for building the Great Pyramids. I think we can call it without too much hyperbole, the lost city of the pyramid. Beneath the sand lies a treasure trove of information about the living conditions of the pyramid builders. We've been excavating here for 30 years. We always put the sand back so that we can come back and continue our research. Otherwise, the site would not preserve. Information that suggests this might have been more than a massive slave camp. We've reconstructed one of the small houses right on top of the original. Because it's a simple house for a rather minor official, you have in place of a great reception room, this one rectangular space with a bench, what's called a mastaba in Arabic. Probably it was covered with reed mats or even rugs and pillows. Here we have a bed platform, probably covered with pillows and mats. Wide enough, we think, for a man, an official, to stretch out, but also not just himself, possibly even a spouse. At the back of the house, Mark's team has uncovered evidence of a bread oven and other traces of food preparation. We found here a round silo for grain, probably wheat. When they ground the wheat into flour, and probably one of the members of the house was on his or her knees, grinding the grain into flour and collecting it into little jars. The important part of finding this little urban estate, we call it the Eastern Townhouse, is that it shows that families were living here. Mark thinks this house belonged to one of the supervisors. But what about the ordinary workers? By excavating the entire site, Mark has been able to figure out where they live, too. Town planners organize the city into three districts. One brings together the nobility, supervisors, and the royal guard. Another holds bakeries, slaughterhouses, breweries, and craftsmen. The center of the city is reserved for the huge pyramid workforce. They live in a series of dormitories built side by side, each over 100 feet long and housing several dozen workers. The barracks, these big corridors, these galleries, were probably gender segregated, probably mostly men and probably mostly young men who were rotating in and out of the labor force. Young men from their own home villages all over Egypt, they probably stayed together in gangs or groups. The barracks where the workers lived don't appear to be locked away like some sort of slave encampment. Instead, they're in the center of a large city, So Marcus discovered where they lived. And there is also evidence of how they lived. We know that these people building the pyramids were taken care of pretty well. There's a lot of meat coming into the site to support them. While excavating on the Giza Plateau, they found these large bread molds. So a lot of people were eating bread as their main source of sustenance. We also have catfish remains. So catfish um, was actually on the menu also quite a bit for the pyramid workers. Very different from the hand-to-mouth existence of most Bronze Age people. If you were working on one of these royal projects, you probably had greater confidence 
in the regularity and the quantity of your ration. Keeping Khufu's workforce well fed was vital to the project's success. If you want the pyramid to be completed on time, you have to make your workers happy. You have to feed them, you have to keep them strong. All the evidence that Mark has uncovered seems to counter the legend of Khufu enslaving and mistreating his workers. By finding this new information about the pyramid, it's completely changing our knowledge about how the pyramids were built. Herodotus' account of 100,000 slaves finds no documentary evidence from Egypt of the time. What the workman's village at Giza, associated with the Great Pyramid, shows us is that these are professional people. We have a large number of skilled people who are probably passing these skills down from father to son, mother to daughter, etc. So these are professional people all engaged in a great building project. But if they weren't slaves, how did Khufu compel these people to work for him? Clues unearthed in a lost city suggest that the builders of the Great Pyramid weren't enslaved by their pharaoh Khufu. Instead, he probably formed his workforce from a mix of paid craftsmen and conscripted labor in a form similar to military service. Young men registered for draft so that they would work at the Great Pyramid. Can you imagine one of these peasants as he's ferried downstream, comes up to the Giza Plateau, and in the background he sees this massive pyramid rising in the distance. Men moving these two and a half ton blocks of stone. It must have been simply awe-inspiring. Khufu unites his people behind a common goal, motivating them with food, duty, and camaraderie rather than force. By assembling a workforce from all over Egypt, Khufu was able to spread his influence and ideas across the country. One of the positive views of pyramid building that it did help to interlace the king's power throughout the land. It did help create a sense of national identity. Every person participated in this pyramid were thinking, and they believed that by building the pyramid, it built Egypt. They are helping their king to uh, resurrect. The typical day for a skilled craftsman or supervisor likely looked very different to the slavery images of legend. At dawn, the craftsman gets up. He washes himself and dresses in a simple kilt or linen loincloth. Surrounded by his family, he recites prayers. They worship Ra, the god of the sun and the creator of the universe. His first meal of the day is bread, dried fish, and garlic, all accompanied by beer. The craftsman then leaves his home for what ancient records suggest was a 10-hour working day. He crosses one of the three main streets of the worker's city, which is probably already busy. Never before has a pharaoh gathered so many farmers, craftsmen, and workers in one place. Think if you're a young person. You come from a village that numbers only a few hundred people, and you come here at Giza. So you join thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. When you went back to your village, you didn't go back the same young person as when you came. You had this sense of identity, something bigger. Mark Lehner thinks the Wall of the Crow is the barrier between city and pyramid site. So the young men every day would probably go rank and file through this gate, because on the other side, you have the quarries, 
So that's where their work was. Khufu's well-organized city ensures the workforce are well cared for and ready to work hard on the pyramid. These men will need to cut, move, and assemble some six million tons of stone. To extract a block of stone, the workers start by marking out its dimensions. Then they dig trenches on each side and crack open its base to free it. Workers place stone below their newly cut block to break its fall when they tip their finished block to the ground. A laborious job, which the workers carry out in teams. Egyptologists estimate that 2,000 stonemasons worked in the quarry, extracting 200 blocks a day, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons. So this is one of the big quarry blocks. It's a very nice example of where probably one person was subdividing this big block, like cutting a piece of cake. It wasn't pleasant work. I mean, this person or persons must have been in here working all day long, just wide enough for one, <clears throat> with hammer stones, mallet, chisel, driving this channel forward. We know that because you can see the striations. It's a good example of how hard this work was. The work is not just hard, it's also dangerous. Accidents are thought to have been frequent and brutal. But if the pyramid is to be completed on time, Khufu can't afford to lose his workforce one injury at a time. Egypt pyramid workers suffered from all sorts of issues relating to back-breaking labor. They suffered more from injuries relating to moving large blocks and having to push and use a lot of force. We have also information that some of them were treated on the site. And we know that there was a lot of medical knowledge in the ancient Egyptians um, from the pyramid workers, because we have people whose bones have broken, they've been splintered together, so you know that it was tied together and the way it would be today. Historians have deciphered tomb engravings that expose more about the medical care pyramid builders got. Pesachet is a fascinating woman from ancient Egypt. We know that she lived during the reign of Khufu because her name is present in a tomb monument. And she has a unique title, Overseer of Physicians. Unfortunately, that's where our knowledge ends. We don't know whether Pesachet was herself a doctor it gives us more tantalizing hints at what might be the case. There were a lot of remedies involving plants, sometimes um, little bits, maybe animal bits as well, uh, sort of bone marrow to drink to strengthen yourself. And so headaches, pains, aches in the joint, coughs, runny noses, all of these would have been dealt with. There were eye diseases that they knew about, and these two would have had remedies. Broken bones were a more serious matter. Texts from later periods of Egypt give accounts of how doctors worked. If Pesachet herself examined the workers, she would invoke the god of medicine, Sekhmet, to help. <laughs> to treat the arm fracture, 
she would use a method still practiced today. She starts by realigning the bone. Then she immobilizes the arm by fitting a wooden splint. Finally, she covers the wound with honey. It acts as a disinfectant and an anti-inflammatory too. For more serious injuries, doctors sometimes risk performing a much more extreme operation. Amputation. Archaeologists working at Giza have found the skeleton of a man who survived 14 years after his leg was amputated. And religion played a role in medical care, too. Magic was tied up with healing. So you could go and have a scorpion bite and then go to a female healer or a male healer, and they could prescribe you a spell. Now, an incredible discovery is exposing the importance of religion and magic in the lives of pyramid workers. While Mark Lehner is investigating the lost city of the pyramid workers, a team of Egyptian archaeologists has made an incredible discovery that helps reveal what else might have motivated them to work. A guard on a donkey it tripped over a mud brick wall. Clearly, there was some kind of structure here, so they started excavating. And they found first one tomb, and then they found another tomb and another. So it seemed compelling that what we have here is the tombs of the workers who built the pyramids. There are hundreds of them just outside the workers' city. This was excavated over many years, and it's one of the most important discoveries at Giza, I think, in the last uh, century. Now I'm standing in the lower part. You have a little mastabas. These are all of mud brick and broken stone. The people buried around us were probably, some of them were just workers. So it looks like lower status people were buried down below, higher status people, probably their superiors were buried up above. There was some interesting evidence of this. For example, one of the people here had hieroglyphs in his tomb mentioning the title Overseer of the Sides of a Pyramid. These titles on the tombs are like a resume of all their work. Those who could afford it would want to start working on their tomb while they're still alive, make sure the inscriptions are there. If they got a promotion, they would want that new title inscribed in the tomb. These are the frozen moments on the Giza tomb walls that tell you everything about ancient Egyptian society. The discovery offers archaeologists a unique insight into the lives of the workers. Studying their bones, the tomb objects that went along with them, and any tomb decoration that they had fills in some of those gaps in knowledge that we have. The tombs suggest another motivation for the workers. They wanted to hitch a ride to the afterlife with their pharaoh and his pyramid. It's hard to say for certain, but I think the prestige of being associated with the Great Pyramid might very well have been part of the motivation for 
workers who were part of that project. So if you work on the royal tomb at Giza, if you help create the largest pyramid that Egypt's ever seen, then you get rewarded not only with your day-to-day -day wages, but also the potential to be buried close to the king at Giza. We can assume that those who were able to build their tombs closer to the pyramid would benefit from the semi-divine or divine aspect of the king in his royal resting place nearby. The workers' tombs at Giza are yet more evidence to challenge the account of Herodotus and his vision of a hundred thousand slaves being forced to work. It tells us that those people were not slaves. If they were slaves, they will never be buried beside the pyramid. They will never wish to be in the shadow of their king. Herodotus's account of the slave driving Khufu strikes me as being a similar to modern responses. How on earth could anyone build that structure? And the answer has to be, you simply had to force everyone to work for you to do it. But archaeologists now think that Khufu was using an existing and well-trained workforce. 340 limestone blocks had to be placed every single day. And stones had to be delivered every 34 minutes. That is a lot of workforce, and that's a lot of administration that you need in order to build something of this size. The Great Pyramid of Khufu further solidifies the administrative and economic base of ancient Egypt. We have another generation of workmen and administrators and craftsmen that are now trained and making the largest pyramid ever constructed in ancient Egypt. Like his father before him, Khufu sets up farms and estates to provide for his pyramid builders. Setting up these establishments would put in place people who would turn arable land, land that could be put under cultivation, they would actually then put it under cultivation. So as these projects go, we're also seeing vastly larger numbers of cities and farms being added to Egypt itself. The nation is really coming together even more than in previous reigns. Tremendous numbers of people are working towards the same goal, building a monumental tomb for their king. So we see with yet another generation that Egypt as a whole is working towards a massive unified project. And this in turn enhances the stability of the state. Khufu has done everything he can to ensure that his pyramid is finished before he dies. He's picked his vizier, Hemiunu, to head up the construction. He's built an entire city for the workers and provides them with food and medical care. And he motivates them further with the promise of their own tombs close to the pyramid. But some 20 years after work began, the Great Pyramid is not complete, and all the work will be for nothing if it's not finished before Khufu dies.